Please welcome Mick Kirsten, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder, TaskTop Technologies. Today, we heard a lot about cloud, data, analytics, and AI. And what's really behind these trends and the shift of these technologies is that every company, every large company in every industry needs to become a software innovator to thrive over the next 10 years. Companies that master software delivery at scale will survive digital disruptions. Those that don't will decline and fall behind. And what I'm here to tell you about is why this shift at a business level from project thinking to product thinking is so critical to becoming an innovator in the age of software. So I spent the first decade of my career as a software developer. I wrote a ton of code. I was a researcher as well at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center that created some of the most popular software technologies, such as graphical user interfaces, the mouse, and so on. And I actually worked on programming languages because I thought, and the rest of my team thought, that we could code our way out of any problem. We could build software to get out of any problem. And as I was doing this, I was seeing the difference between the productivity of my own team, uh, who was building this programming language and working in open source, and then the productivity of the organizations using our software. So really, enterprise organizations trying to become software innovators. And I know this pretty bizarre thing. So I was extremely productive myself. At least I felt that way. Uh, I managed to write over this decade over a million lines of open source software code that's still in, in production use today. And when I started working with organizations that were actually adopting these technologies, I actually did my PhD uh, in how we can more closely connect business value streams to software value streams. And as companies started adopting our technologies, I realized that there's basically a hundred, a two order of magnitude difference between the productivity I was seeing in enterprise IT and enterprise software organizations and what I was seeing working with highly effective open source teams. So I thought there's something fundamentally broken about this. And I started learning more and more about it. I started working with more and more IT leaders, CIOs, and so on. Uh, I have a much worse metric over that decade, the last decade of my career, which is over a million air miles traveled and trying to learn why these software technologies, those innovations, are so much harder to adopt in established businesses and at scale. And from this, I created the Flow Framework to help organizations use those same methodologies, approaches to agility that allow startups and open source projects and tech giants to thrive. And this is really captured in the book Project to Product, now a, a best-selling book, uh, which I'll summarize for you today. So I'm going to take us back a bit to 2007, back when Nokia realized that they needed to become a software innovator to really tell you some of the story of what's happening in other industries today. It just happened much earlier to Nokia. And the really interesting thing about Nokia is that they realized that a disruption was coming a year before we all met the iPhone in 2006. They knew that there was going to be this much bigger screen. And remember, Nokia had become very good at their existing business. They'd been, well, the first business was, uh, was rubber boots and such, but then they pivoted into manufacturing and be basically created the, the mobile industry. Um, they realized, as the iPhone was going to get released, that they would be able to manufacture phones with capacitive touch screens, but that there'd be this big bottleneck of actually filling that screen with software. The operating systems, the software architecture they had, wouldn't quite scale to what was happening on that screen. So they decided to become agile. And they decided to adopt Agile at scale. And it actually became the poster child for software agility. So they created Nokia Siemens Networks, created something called the Nokia Test for how agile the teams were, because the business at a board level, at a CEO level, knew they needed to transform back in 2006. Now, what was so interesting is that this was actually our first enterprise customer uh, from my company, Desktop Technologies, which I founded right after completing my PhD on this topic. And they were trying to adopt some of our open source technology, so it was actually working with the engineering leaders themselves in their agile transformation. And what I noticed that was really strange to me is that they were not optimizing their end-to-end -end value streams. We heard today about the importance of optimizing things like lead time. They were actually approaching this very differently. They were focused, in my view, on this tiny slice of software delivery, of how quickly the developers close their issues and close tasks. And I thought there's something very wrong about this, and I started realizing that in agile literature, this is really what's happening. We're optimizing this tiny slice, how much time developers spend doing things, rather than looking from the point of view of the customer and from the point of view of the business, and really looking end to end. And what was so fascinating about this is that Nokia was succeeding in their agile transformation from the way they were measuring it. From that point of view, they were adopting agile practices, adopting agile tools. As they were doing that, nothing was moving any faster, because their bottleneck was not actually agile development. 
Nokia could have hired double, maybe 10 times the developers, but because their constraint was not in development, it was elsewhere, they would not have moved any faster. The result of this was, of course, that Nokia lost the entire mobile market created. 99% of the value that Nokia had uh, when it had the majority stake in that majority of that market vanished to what felt to us like basically overnight. Even though this company did every, it seemingly everything right, brought in the best consultants as they tried to transform. And so the lesson for me, having a, a seat at this by them being one of our customers, is that these silos, so only looking at development alone and proxy metrics, measuring how many people we've trained on Agile can actually destroy transformations. If we optimize somewhere that's not the constraint, for Nokia the constraint was the technical debt in that operating system we were using on those phones, the, the Symbian operating system. That could not be scaled to those big screens, to that kind of digital experience. Uh, you can be investing in exactly the wrong place and you won't even know it because you're not measuring the right thing. Here's another quick example. This is Barclays Bank value stream. They were celebrating how agile they were because they had done a lot of great work. People I knew did all this great work on their agile transformation. But then uh, Jonathan Smart, one of the people behind this, put up this slide saying, look, we're so freaking agile, yay. Meanwhile, we're taking six months to even to go from a business need to actually getting something to a developer, and then it takes us many more weeks to actually get that to the customer. We're not agile from the customer's point of view. We're agile from IT's point of view. And that's actually meaningless if you look at this from the point of view of the customer. And this just keeps happening. So another top 25 bank. In financial services, we've seen a lot of pressure on transformation as the tech giants are moving into that area more quickly than some others. So this is the global banks. The story is detailed in the book, Project to Product. Third transformation, now they're doing agile, a new methodology called DevOps. And because this is so critical to the bank, the incremental budget for this transformation is over a billion dollars. So it's being taken very seriously, this little transformation at the board level, at the executive level. Uh, what I noticed, this was very similar to Nokia, is that the way this transformation is being managed is like the way other projects are being managed by the bank, which is through project management that basically disconnects IT from business. Two years later, the transformation is deemed a success. After I interviewed people as I did with Nokia, I learned that IT is generally perceived to be delivering even less to the business than they were before. Things got worse, not better, at the end of this transformation. And this is because there's this layer that was completely misleading between the business and technology. These things are disconnected, things are thrown over the fence. And the second key epiphany in the book is that project management and managing everything to cost instead of value is the wrong model. This is what derails your transformations. This is what prevents you from becoming a software innovator. And the urgency around all this is accelerating. If you look at the retail market, this is just an early indicator, similar to how Nokia was. You've got a company there. This is the stock price change of Amazon versus other key retailers between 2006 and 2016. You can see a company that's aligned its product value streams, its software architecture, and its organizational structure around product, innovation, and delivery around software. Um, they've been able to use that to create a platform for disruption. Those other organizations, they've been trying, but they're approaching it the wrong way. They're still approaching it from that mentality of project management. We're actually seeing some of those organizations go bankrupt now. And this rate of change, it's not equal between the different industries, but it is accelerating. At today's, even at today's rate, half of the S&P 500 is projected to be replaced in the next 10 years. So I got to wondering, has this ever happened before? Have we seen this kind of rate of disruption, you know, this number of technology buzzwords at every conference in every industry? And if we zoom out, what, what does it actually look like historically? So I'll give you a really quick uh, history lesson of why I think this movement from project to product is so key. If we look at the work of Dr. Claude Perez, who wrote a book, or published a book in 2002 called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, she introduces these five revolutions, industrial, steam and railways, steel and heavy engineering, oil and mass production, which really drove the last wave of change, and then software and digital, which is driving today's rate of change. What's so interesting about her work is that she breaks down in her models each of those waves, they happen about every 50 years, into an installation period where some new means of production becomes cheap, where we learn how to pull oil from the ground, where we learn how to mass produce cars. Then a turning point, and then a deployment period. So in this installation period, there's all this financial capital that's trying to make a high return on that new means of production. This is the point where, over a century ago, Detroit alone has over 300 car startups, because all this money wants to invest in car startups and make a large return. Then in the turning points, the giants, the new incumbents that disrupt what came before them are established, 
And in deployment period, the new means of production actually gets disseminated across the, the broader parts of the economy. Where we are today is we've had this period of creative destruction where every industry has thousands of different startups disrupting everything. Uh, we've got the new incumbents. We've got the new Fords and GMs here. Those are the tech giants. Uh, you take the tech giants, the nine of them, between uh, those logos, um, the BATS, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, and Microsoft, that's an economy the size of Japan. And it's just getting larger and larger. It's larger than the world's third largest economy when you put those nine tech giants together. And they've truly learned how to master software at scale. Microsoft, Google effectively work with billion line code bases. So what happens now is either they continue growing or the rest of the industry learns how to adapt and how to actually build and manage software at scale at a business level, not just at a technology level, which is when we get to the point of wealth generation, uh, as has happened with all the other ages, where mass production actually was learned across the whole economy rather than being concentrated in a few companies. So the question is, how do we get there? And the answer is, we don't get there with the technology of project management was made for building bridges and large oil rigs. Those things are great for making amazing things like the Burj Khalifa. They're horrible for becoming a software innovator in a changing marketplace with a changing technology stack. So each of those revolutions has come with a new managerial principle. And while we'll continue using project management for all sorts of things, we cannot use it for software innovation. And I'll give you a really quick example of a company that's made the transition from the last stage into this one. And this is why there's the card that started the talk. BMW Group mastered uh, mass production, became one of those logos that we recognize. And so I want to understand how, at a business level, did they make it through that last turning point where so many companies, the vast majority of car manufacturers died. And they're one of our largest customers, so I got invited to do a two-day tour of their flagship plant, the BMW Leipzig plant in Germany. What's so fascinating about this plant is that there's not Gantt charts anywhere on the walls. Everything around there is, is built around lean principles, around reducing waste. So the lean principles, and I think it's key for us to always remind ourselves of these, is that you precisely specify value by product. These are from James Womack's book. Ident you identify the value stream for each product. You make value flow without interruptions and you let the customer pull value from the consumer. It's not about building software for software, IT for IT. It's about delivering value to a customer along a value stream as quickly with as much velocity as possible. Even the BMW plant is all arranged according to value streams. I think this is something that's familiar to you. But within IT, we tend to architect things for architecture's sake. So if we contrast now car production and enterprise IT, in car production, everything's around these integrated production lines. In Enterprise IT, we have these disconnected tool chains. We're throwing things over the fence. Everything is managed as products versus being managed as projects. Everything in car production is architect around flow, how quickly you can get a car to the customer from order to delivery in that BMW Leipzig plant. Uh, every card is delivered just in sequence. So the order that the cars, uh, car orders came in on is the order they drive off the plant to the customer or to the dealership. In enterprise IT, we tend to architect things around technology. Everything in car production is optimized end-to-end. -end. You're always thinking end-to-end, -end, not in terms of these local silos or cycle times. Um, and everything, this is the key part I want to get across, which is that everything's around measuring business results. What was the revenue generated by the i3 versus by the i8? They have very different value streams as BMW tries to deal with a disruption coming from Tesla. Rather than measuring proxy metrics, which is how quickly the developers work, how many tests did we automate, how many times did we deploy? Those are proxy metrics, not business metrics. We need to shift our software practices uh, to a, a business level. So at the core of this flow framework is, is this notion of what flows in software delivery. We know what f flows in extraction. We know what, what flows in the car factory. It's, it's cars that, in the case of BMW, deliver sheer driving pleasure. The key question is, how do we measure flow in software delivery? And so this is really the core contribution of this flow framework I created. And we have to take it from the point of view of customer pull. So customers pull features. That's new business value that's delivered by them. This is why if you have new features in, uh, in the product, you'll actually want to use that product. Uh, defects, they want the price to work well. Risks, uh, risk management is a key part of software today, given how critical it's become to our society. So this is data privacy, security, and so on. And debts, we need to reduce technical debt because technical debt is a fundamental aspect of building software that's, that's not innate to people who have not grown up in software delivery. Each of these four flow items are mutually exclusive and comprehensively exhaustive. And this is the key thing. If from a business level you decide to invest more in one, you're going to implement more regulation, you'll get fewer features done. 
And this is how we get the business and the technologist on the same page, by understanding these trade-offs of what flows in software delivery. So I'll give you a really simple example here. Um, and this is basically around the push to market. A lot of us have wanted to bring a new innovative product to market, a transformation of some internal offering, per perhaps. The success of any digital product is really comes from how many features that delight your customer or your partner that you'll deliver. As that happens, the flow framework tells us debt and risks will rise because you're focusing on features. Developers are taking shortcuts. Quality gets reduced over time, and defect work goes up and up to the point where almost every software company has found itself in this point of a death spiral where defect work goes up, everyone's disappointed on the business side, the customers are seeing more and more defects, they're seeing fewer and fewer features, and feature work goes down to zero. So this, this has happened basically to every, every innovative organization. And I'll give you now another example of something that Microsoft did differently. Back in 2003, uh, Bill Gates put out the trustworthy computing memo that says, we're going to stop all feature work across all Microsoft value streams, which is basically what no uh, enterprise company CEO has said ever, because of course Microsoft was dealing with a lot of competition at that time. So feature work stops. Uh, that allowed Microsoft to focus on debt work, on trustworthy computing, on securing the Windows servers and tools and other platforms. Uh, debts and risks went down, and now we actually have the most valuable public company in the world as a result of this, uh, because of the platform they created allowed them to innovate, created this platform for innovation. So the goal of the Flow Framework is to basically bring this kind of thinking, which, of course, Bill Gates and uh, the other CEOs of all the other tech giants, each of whom was a former software developer, have innately to today's business leaders. And so the Flow Framework has us focus on measuring flow in terms of all our product software value streams. So you set up not projects, but product value streams. And for each of those product value streams, you measure how much velocity you deliver these flow items in, how efficiently, um, how much time each one took end to end from the customer's point of view, not the developer's point of view, and how much load you had on your value streams. Because like with manufacturing, if we overload our product value streams, say over 80%, you actually get less out, not more. And this is something that you can't see unless you measure it. Um, and you correlate those to business results. How much value was delivered to this product, through this product value stream? Um, what's the happiness of the staff working on this product value stream? What was its cost? So you actually know when to, when to end of life digital products because you have a notion of life cycle profitability. So I'll give you a really quick example of how important this is. And this is a, a presentation given by Nationwide Insurance at a conference about a year ago. They were trying to understand why it took 120 days to deliver a feature to customers. And so we worked with them, we instrumented their value streams, we actually measured things across their software value stream. They realized that only 2.5% of the time was spent in development. And of course, the CIO at that time was thinking they needed to hire double the developers to move faster. They didn't. They needed to hire more designers. They needed to remove constraints on their security approval processes that were actually making them less secure, not more secure. And by seeing this, they were able to invest correctly. And this is why measuring Flow time is so important. You're not looking at just how long testing or development takes. You're looking from a business, from a customer perspective. Um, same with things like looking for where the bottleneck to feature delivery is. And again, what Nationwide learned is they had too few designers, not too few developers. You might find a constraint with you know, too few geologists and so on. So really, the key thing is that we need to connect our value stream networks. Um, we need to track all flow through them. And then we need to correlate that to business results. So this is basically how we do it in my company at Tastop. We've connected all the different tools. And by seeing flows through that, we can actually see where we need to improve, where we need to invest. So here's a very quick example. But basically, we were trying to bring this product to market. The flow load went up. So we needed to finish all these features. The product owners knew that. As soon as we did that, the flow time also went up. So how long it took to, each, to do each feature got worse. In other words, we actually made ourselves more inefficient by having the teams do more features. We saw that instantly, then we pulled back, and we realized we would actually increase throughput by reducing the load on those teams who are thrashing with too many features. And all of this can be visible if you start looking at your soft what flows through your software delivery the same way that you do through your other operations. So really, the whole idea is that we move away from this waterfall orientation for software innovation into a flow orientation. We're constantly tracking results. Um, we move from basically project management becoming this black box, insulating IT as a black box, insulating IT R&D as a black box, and start seeing direct visibility over what's flowing in software delivery and what business results that's generating, how much revenue that's generating, how much cost that's reducing. And this has been something very interesting. I've been uh, collaborating some with 
Milos Milosevic in terms of how Halliburton has been, and Landmark have been shifting away from this mentality where you make these very long software projects, you decide what risks there are up front, rather than moving fast and learning as you go and incrementally funding where you're providing your customers, this group, with the most business results, with the most outcomes, which is exactly what this product mindset is about. So another key part of this transformation, another, another one that Landmark's actually been a the forefront of is that in a project mindset, you treat people as resources. You can do that with contractors when you're building large buildings or data centers. You can't do that with a complex task of software delivery. You need to bring work to people rather than bringing people to work because if you assign people to more than one product project, they actually thrash and they don't learn as quickly as they should. Again, another key innovation that's been here. And finally, at the architectural level, um, you need to invest in these different product-oriented value streams. So just an example, so you have some of what you've seen in terms of um, assisted lithology applications that will be offered to business uh, and the entire ecosystem, those are built on key internal applications such as decision space. The fact that decision space is able to power those innovations that Landmark then provides to you and the entire ecosystem um, is absolutely critical. So same thing with open earth. The fact that we're actually connecting the value stream network, the tooling itself, and Landmark is exposing that is an example of product thinking that I think everyone needs to bring on into their internal companies consuming these software services and products uh, from Landmark. So to summarize quickly, disruption will only accelerate in the age of software, and today's IT practices and project management won't scale. The shift from project to product is critical. And to do that, you need to connect your value stream network and measure flow through that network, connect it to your operating model and your business results. That's what the flow framework helps you do. And then for more information, check out project2product.org. You can get the book and ebook, flowframework.org. And we've got um, more information on tasktop.coms around our offerings for that. So with that, thank you very much.